Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Once again tonight, I am joined by Bill Reel for part two of our examination of Book of Abraham, Apologetics. In part one, we went over in some detail, but I hope with some clarity, regarding the two main theories that faithful Mormons still maintain regarding the book of Abraham. They are divided primarily into two camps, one of which, be, excuse me, one of which is the uh, missing scroll theory camp, and the other one is the catalyst theory camp. And both camps, both theories suffer from being untenable, but they are untenable in different ways. In the missing scroll theory, they honor the fact that Joseph Smith clearly stated that he was translating the book of Abraham from papyri that he had in his possession. And they believe it is a literal translation from the papyri in his possession. But the fact that the book of Abraham does not match the papyri that was found makes them claim that there is a missing scroll. They claim that in spite of the fact that the papyri that has been discovered indisputably shows that Joseph Smith was using the papyri that was discovered to translate what we have today as the Book of Abraham. And that, coupled with the Egyptian alphabet and grammar, makes the case solid. So it's untenable in that way, the missing scroll theory. On the other hand, the catalyst theory honors the evidence that Joseph Smith obviously was translating from the papyri that has been recovered. They honor the historical and obvious textual evidence that he was doing that. But they say that even though he thought he was translating from that, he was actually getting inspiration from God through a separate but direct pipeline that what he was translating ended up not being what he thought he was translating and what he claimed to be translating, but actually ended up being something completely different, which is nevertheless an inspired text, which they count as scripture. Now, that position is untenable for two reasons, first of which is because it's indistinguishable from an intentional fraud. It's obviously a theory that they are pushed to because of the evidence, but it's also untenable because the catalyst theory does not honor Joseph Smith's claim to have been translating directly from the papyrus. So both arguments, both positions are untenable for different reasons. And if you're going to choose between one camp or the other, you have to decide which position is the least untenable. So that's how I characterize the two camps, the missing scroll theory camp and the catalyst theory camp. Did you want to add anything to that, Bill, before we go on with the rest of part two? No, I mean, what you, what you laid out, I think is clear. And I think if people go back to part one, they're going to see that I, as you're saying all of that, my one thought is there are apologists on both sides in both camps. And there's a reason they cling so tightly to their side of the coin uh, and it's because they also see the other side as untenable. So if we were to take John Gee and Kerry Molstein, who we, we, we spoke about, they are advocates for the missing scroll theory. My guess is if we could get them on the record, they would say, look, I cannot, I cannot go with this catalyst theory. And they would agree with us on all the flaws of the catalyst theory. On the other hand, if we were to get Robin Scott Jensen and others who are big fans of the catalyst theory instead of the missing scroll theory, uh, they would say like, yeah, I just can't get on board with that missing scroll. The data imposes that that theory does not work. And what I find is that all of these guys, I have to wonder what would happen to them if they had to come to grips that their side of the coin, too, was also untenable. I think it's a position where uh, it may be difficult for them to see personally the deficiencies in their own position while being able to see with great clarity the deficiencies in the other position. Yeah, and I wonder how fragile their faith is if they could see the problematic nature of the position they hold. So tonight, what we were thinking about doing, we've got um, a lot of ground still to cover. 
And the first thing that I wanted to jump into, because tonight what we're going to essentially talk about are some more flaws with the missing scroll theory. And the reason for that is because, one, John Gee and Kerry Molstein have laid out what I think are some intellectually dishonest and maybe even ethically dishonest uh, assumptions in how they deal with this material. And there's this idea that, okay, there's this missing scroll and they've come forward and they've laid out various parts of evidence that you and I have been talking about over the course of maybe the last week or even two. And so let's jump into some of those and get your thoughts. And I may need your help um, explaining these, what they mean by these in terms of evidence. And then let's also uh, show why they're not strong or maybe even not evidence at all. The first one is in fact, I think it's facsimile one, is it not with the crocodile? So in facsimile one, you've got the lion couch, you've got Abraham upon the lion couch, you've got him about to be uh, slaughtered, and underneath the lion couch are different layers. And one of those layers has a image of a crocodile. And apologists point to this, and they make a connection to an Egyptian god. And I'm wondering, RFM, if you can help the listener understand what the apologist is trying to argue in favor of first, and then we'll get into why it doesn't work. Right. Well, this is figure number nine, and I hope that the audience will open their scriptures with the rest of the class, Bill. Oh, and they're going to need those more than once, RFM. And for our big surprise at the end of the episode, they're going to need that as well. So yes, everybody should push pause, grab your uh, your quad or your pearl of great price, and uh, let's get her open. Okay, so facsimile number one, figure nine, which you can see is the crocodile that's down below where you situated it, Bill. It The interpretation of it is given... Under the explanation with all the different figures, figure nine, the idolatrous god of Pharaoh is what is given there. Now, this is a hit for Joseph Smith because this crocodile god, whose name was Sobek or Sebek, it depends upon which manuscript you're reading, but he was at times associated with Pharaoh. So it would be appropriate and correct to say that figure nine does illustrate, as Joseph Smith interpreted it, the idolatrous god of Pharaoh. Great. So knowing that, here's a couple of questions I want to throw out at you. One is that how many animal gods are there in this culture? Oh, quite a few. But pretty much every animal, I think, in Egyptian... <laughs> Well, I mean, including the cow, right? Hathor, uh, the ibis, uh, yeah, the cat, uh, the jackal, uh, the falcon, uh, yeah, pretty much everything. So every animal that would show up in Egyptian art could be pointed to an Egyptian god. Um, yes, yes. Okay, okay. And on top of that, do we not take every one of these pharaohs or or quite a number of them and they associate themselves with a specific animal? Now that I is honestly beyond my expertise, but I understand that you had an interview with, uh, was it Spencer Wright recently that went up where you discussed this? Yeah, so I had an interview with Spencer Wright, and he was pointing out that in the Egyptian culture, uh, every pharaoh gets kind of labeled with a, spe a specific animal and that animal God. And so we've seen this kind of like in, like in the Native American culture where uh, a Native American will get associated with a bear or an eagle. Um, it happens in the Egyptian culture as well. So it's in some ways, it's kind of like our American sports teams, right? We got the Philadelphia Eagles, we got the Chicago Bears. Every pharaoh who's considered to be a God himself in a way uh, is associated with kind of his spirit animal. And so every, you know, these pharaohs would have been associated with an animal and every animal in Egyptian culture is also uh, seems to be associated with a god. So it, it wouldn't matter what animal is showing. Um, if Joseph said like, hey, that's connected to some type of divine uh, vestiger of, uh, of, of one of these pharaohs, like that connection seems to be... Um, an easy one, like not, not just a coincidence, but it would have happened no matter what was going on in terms of an animal and Joseph associating it that way. Does that make sense? It does. And I just want to push back just a little bit that even though 
I take everything you say as absolutely true, okay? Still, Joseph Smith, looking at this, sees a crocodile and identifies it as the god of Pharaoh. So even though it may not be as incredible a hit as it might seem at first blush, nevertheless, it still is a hit, Bill. I will say, however, that also taking away a little bit from the hit is the fact that there are four other gods that are identified. They are figures five, six, seven, and eight. Those are the four gods that are immediately under the lion couch in the scene. Those represent the four sons of Horus. Now, if Joseph Smith had identified them as the four sons of Horus, then we might not be having this discussion tonight. Or if he had identified figure number nine, the crocodile, as Sebek or Sobek, that would have been pretty darn incredible. He didn't do that. But five, six, seven, and eight, if you look at them, five is basically these four sons of Horus identified as, once again, animal figures. Number five is the hawk, six is a jackal, seven is a lion, and eight, even though it has kind of a strange beak-like thing on it, I my understanding is that that is a representation of a man. Joseph Smith gives... I'm assuming that's an Egyptian beard. I don't think... Uh, my recollection, Bill, is that it's not really a beard, but it's probably an infelicity in the way it was placed into either the wood carving or the lead metal plate that was used to print this. Um, but Joseph Smith does give interpretations for each of those, and he gives them as the idolatrous god of Elkina, figure five, the idolatrous god of Libna, figure six, uh, figure seven, the idolatrous god of Mamakra, and figure eight, the idolatrous god of Korash. Well, the four sons of Horus have names, and they are nothing like the four names that Joseph Smith has attributed to them. So I think that the best that we can say for Joseph Smith here is that he got one out of five. One out of five, kind of, and then the other four out of five, a really bad miss. They are really, really bad, yeah. So if we go to facsimile number two, the hypocephalus. We have to go to facsimile two because the four sons of Horus were very popular in Egyptian iconography. And they end up also being represented in facsimile number two, the hypocephalus. And Joseph Smith, another one of the hits that people tend to point to is this idea of these canopic jars. And if I'm not mistaken, Joseph pronounces that these are the four directions, right? If you look at facsimile number two and you find figure six, this is a little bit more complicated to find because it's much more intricate a drawing. It is actually down in the lower left-hand corner. And you'll see, once again, the four figures, although they're standing here. These are, once again, the four sons of Horus. And th they look like they're hanging from the ceiling because, actually, you would turn it upside down in order for them to be standing upright the way it's drawn. But those are labeled as figure six. And over on the other page, the explanation Joseph Smith gave for them was, represents this earth in its four quarters. Okay, so he gives it the, the four quarters. Now, he might have at least been shown to have common sense on this had he labeled them with the same false names he had labeled in facsimile one. Yes, uh, there's no indication that he recognizes that these are the same individuals as the four sons of Horus in facsimile number one. Even with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right, even with the revelation, but which he was using in order to translate this. But um, he does uh, interpret it as this earth in its four quarters. Now, this is uh, brought out frequently by apologists as another hit by Joseph Smith. And it is a hit of a sort. It's probably less impressive even than labeling the crocodile as the god of Pharaoh in facsimile number one. Because it is possible that you could say that the four sons of Horus represent this earth in its four quarters. Now, here's what I mean. My understanding is that even though the four sons of Horus are talked about in a number of ancient texts from Egypt, there is one text that describes the four sons of Horus going to the four quarters of the earth. And I think they may have a message to deliver or something like that. So there's one text that does that. Now, that's all it says about them. So if I were to come along and say that the four sons of Horus represent the four quarters of the earth, well... Uh, it's kind of a stretch because I'm not sure that an Egyptian would think that they represent the four quarters of the earth, but they would know that 
there was a story where they went to the four quarters of the earth. So this is a less impressive hit to me. Can I give you an example by comparison? Sure. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. Pretty much all Mormons know about the four angels holding back the winds from the four quarters of the earth. Well, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1 is the passage that talks about them. And they are sent to the four quarters of the earth in order to hold back the winds. And and then the, the story continues from there. But if we were to say that these four angels represented the four quarters of the earth, you can see why, yeah, they went to the four quarters of the earth and they're doing something there, holding back the winds. But is it really a hit to say that they represent the four quarters of the earth? Well, we can sort of see it, but it's really not that impressive. So there we've got the two major hits. Unfortunately, the, the other thing you have to add about these four angels in Revelation 7-1, they're not given names, okay? But let's say they were named. And let's say their names were A, B, C, and D. And then a person came along and said, well, these angels represent the four quarters of the earth. And by the way, their names are not A, B, C, and D. They are E, F, G, and H. <laughs> Okay, because that's really what's happening here. So when you take that into account as well, it's sort of mm, maybe it's a, a bullseye on its face. But when you dig a little deeper, it becomes less and less impressive. Okay, so we've knocked those two down. Oh, I've got to say something else. Bill, I'm so sorry. I know you, keep, you want to keep going on. I know we've got a lot to cover. But we're just talking about a very few things here, which are generally brought out by the apologists. We also have to take into account that there are many, many, many other explanations and interpretations that Joseph Smith gives, not only a facsimile one, but a facsimile two and facsimile three, where he gets basically everything wrong, horribly wrong. And by wrong, I mean, it doesn't match what it really says in Egyptian. As an example from a figure facsimile two, let's just say Uh, Figure three, because I know you're going to want to get to this one, right? Figure three. If you can find figure three on facsimile two, it's in the upper right-hand corner. It's in the northeast portion of the hypocephalus. By the way, it's called a hypocephalus because it was put under hypo, the head, cephalus of the dead body in order to help him in the afterlife and find out where he was going. You have to take these hits in the context or these marginal hits or these sort of hits in the context of these absolute, completely erroneous and apparently made up translations that Joseph Smith offers, such as figure three is made to represent God sitting upon his throne, clothed with power and authority, with a crown of eternal light upon his head, representing also the grand key words of the holy priesthood, as revealed to Adam in the Garden of Eden, as also to Seth, Noah, Melchizedek, Abraham, and all to whom the priesthood was revealed. Or figure two, stand by the Uh, It's not going to be a big surprise to you that that has nothing to do with actual what is there in figure six Um, or uh, no, I'm sorry, figure three or figure one being collabed, signifying the first creation nearest to the celestial at the residence of God. First in government, the last pertaining to the measurement of time, the measurement according to celestial time, which celestial time signifies one day to a cubit. One day in Kolob is equal to a thousand years according to the measurement of this earth, which is called by the Egyptians Yah-O-E. And I'm pronouncing the J as a Y. So when you look at the marginal hits that occur in the explanations, you also have to compare them to the absolute incorrect explanations in order to put them in context and get a real sense for how impressive the hits are. Yeah, and my favorite one is uh, figure seven. Uh, And you're going to want to try to find one of the original uh, images of this facsimile from an earlier edition of the scriptures, or you're going to want to find one probably after like 1981. What you're going to notice is that there is a being sitting on some type of uh, chair or stool. And uh, Joseph labeled this heavenly father upon his throne. The trouble is it is the... Uh, phallic god men with his erect penis, by the way. Um, And the thing with this is the idea that on some level, the church must have been embarrassed by this because I think around 1967, uh, in that edition of the scriptures, when it came out uh, in the Pearl of Great Price, they removed uh, the 
uh, genitals of men uh, so that 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 little uh, little rectangle thing sticking out there was gone. And then by 1981, uh, they had put that back in. And I think they realized like, oh, we're not going to get away with being able to remove this thing that's embarrassing. You did an episode... Um, maybe maybe almost a year ago at this point, Elder Ballard blows up the church, uh, where you pointed out multiple occasions where while Elder Ballard says the church has never hid anything, uh, on some level, we've got to come to grips with even on this small little idea of Joseph mistranslating this image, and rather than being the god-men uh, with an erected uh, an erect penis... Uh, it was Heavenly Father on his throne, which is translated completely wrong, that the church under some level of embarrassment removed that for almost uh, about a decade and a half uh, because of them being embarrassed by the fact. And again, I'm guessing they were embarrassed. It's the one thing that was taken out and the one thing put back in. It just seems a little odd to be a coincidence. Uh, But on some level, if that's the case, then the church uh, really can't stand behind the statement that it doesn't hide anything. Hmm. Well, maybe it was simply a case of penis envy. (laughs) Well, maybe. From 1967 till till 1981, men on figure seven, on facsimile number two, that men had the TK smoothie for about a decade and a half. (laughs) TK smoothie for men. Joseph, as you pointed out, translates the document collectively, the facsimiles collectively, horribly wrong, deeply wrong. And uh, while there are a couple of like, hey, if we take this one kind of idea and make some allowances and it's only one off, then we've got ourselves a bullseye, which really isn't a bullseye at all. It's barely hitting the broad side of a barn. Um, But so much is wrong with so little being right and not quite right uh, that it really does destroy Joseph's translation of these facsimiles. Um, Do you have any other thoughts before we move on? No, ready to go on, Bill. Perfect. So the next one is actually one of my favorites, and it it kind of helped me hang on to the book of Abraham for just a little longer. It's this idea, Kerry Molstein brings this up, which is um, we try to say this papyri is connected to Abraham. Every Egyptologist outside the church says, no way, Jose. Uh, But what we end up with is Kerry Molstein, uh, an Egyptologist in the church who argues in favor of a missing scroll, says that there is one uh, replica of this breathing permit uh, of whore that has facsimile, I think number one on it, I could be wrong, please correct me if I am, where there's some wording at the bottom, and one of those words is Abraham. And he says, look, if we find one document that's similar to the ones that Joseph had, and it's got the name Abraham at the bottom, then we should easily be able to make the connection that at times the Egyptians used these documents to represent on some level the story of Abraham. But RFM, would you help us understand why that doesn't work? Uh, Yes, certainly. This is actually not a representation. It's not a lion count scene as we have it in facsimile number one. It It is a papyrus that was discovered and published some decades ago now. I think it was uh, the Amherst papyri, though I can't remember the exact number. What it contains is a lion couch. It does have a lion couch and on it, it has a mummy. So it is a mummification scene, but there are none of the other elements, as I recall, on that papyrus, just a lion couch with a mummy on top and underneath it, written apparently by somebody else and probably at a different time, using the same papyri was a series of words, which are names. Some of them were of Hebrew people. Some of them were of other languages and other cultures. And they were strung together in order to create a magical incantation. And the magical incantation was in order to, it was a love potion, basically, by in, by incanting this a man was supposed to be able to get a woman to fall desperately in love with him. But one of the names in the string of names was Abraham. Well, it was A-B-R-A-A-M. It was Abraham, but it's in there with, I think, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then there's others, other names. The idea, though, that this 
identifies the person on the lion couch who is a mummy as Abraham is incorrect. In fact, it's grossly incorrect. Now, the name Abraham does appear on the same piece of parchment as a lion couch with a mummy on it. But there is no way that any respectable Egyptologist would ever say that the papyrus itself identifies the person who is a mummy on the lion couch as Abraham. And yet, and yet, Bill, much to my surprise, that is exactly what Carrie Muelstein does in a video that is on the internet, on YouTube, in which he seeks to defend the book of Abraham against commonly made criticisms. Uh, if you want, we could play that. Let's do it. The Leiden Demotic Papyrus, um, which dates to about the same time frame and again from roughly the same location, it has a lion couch scene, and we don't have the entire uh, portion of the papyrus left, but there is definitely a lion couch scene with the name Abraham right below it. So it, it is associated somehow with that graphic. In there is a lion couch scene. It's actually part of a love charm. And the text says, it's got a picture of a man on a lion couch, and the text says, this, or Abraham upon his couch. All right, so the first voice you heard in that audio from a fair Mormon video, which is trying to show the apologetic argument for the book of Abraham. The first voice was Michael Ash, but the second voice was Kerry Muelstein. He is an Egyptologist, and he has just completely misrepresented what is on that papyrus. Actually, Michael Ash did a little bit better job. He said that there is a lion couch and the name Abraham is on it below it. Now, he didn't talk about how the name Abraham is just a series of names that are all jumbled together. He does, however, mention that Abraham is below it. Now, when you get to Kerry Muelstein, who is the second guy, he mentions that it's a love charm, but then he goes way beyond the evidence and he says that the papyrus says that it is Abraham who is on the couch. That is completely wrong, completely misleading, and given the fact that this is a video production and could have been edited and he could have gone back and corrected it, I think it's intentionally deceptive. Yeah, a couple things. Michael Ash says, you know, it's related in some way. And, and it always feels like when you're having a conversation with an apologist, they never want to tell you the finer details that hurt their argument, that weaken their argument. And so here you have Mike Ash, who, again, I respect to a degree, saying like, yeah, there's na Abraham's name and it's related in some way, but there's this hesitation to want to get into how it's related. You do get Molstein saying it is a love spell, so give him credit for that. But as you point out, he says this is, it. it he says, and we'll play it again, I'll have it play a couple times here. In there is a lion couch scene. It's actually part of a love charm. And the text says, it's got a picture of a man on a lion couch, and the text says, this, or Abraham upon his couch. And the text says, Abraham upon his couch. But you can hear him say, the wording says that it is Abraham upon the couch, uh, in whatever way he says it, but that's what the message is being given. And it, like, as you point out, it's not true. That's not what's being said in the document. And so he's trying to um, embellish this to an extent that it builds faith, but he's also being dishonest and lying. Well, let me tell you, if that papyrus said that that's Abraham upon the couch, that would be the first middle and last thing that we ever heard from apologists. That would be huge evidence in favor of the book of Abraham to have an actual ancient document of papyrus that says Abraham is upon the couch. Now, it still might have its own problems, but that would go a long way toward establishing at least the idea that Abraham anciently could be and was depicted as on a lion couch, even though in this Amherst papyri, I believe it's the Amherst papyri, he is a mummy as opposed to being a live person, as he is in fact simile one. Now, when Michael Ash says the name Abraham is related in some way to the figure on the couch, he's playing fast and loose with language. Michael Ash is a smart guy. He knows, I expect, that the lion couch scene with the mummy on it on this papyri has nothing to do with the magical incantation and sequence of names 
below it. In fact, my understanding is, is that the Egyptological consensus is that they really don't have anything to do with each other. Simply, somebody was using another piece of papyri that had been used by somebody else. Now, they are related in some way, like Michael Ash says, because they're on the same piece of papyri. So, yeah, they're related in some way, but they're really not related at all. Give you an example. Part one, I talked about how Joseph Smith or somebody at his direction had mounted the papyrus fragments onto other paper as backing, right? And that on the reverse side of that paper they used as backing was a map of the city of Kirtland, Ohio. Do you remember that part, Bill? Yeah, that was fascinating. Okay, so if I told you then that the Egyptian papyri was related in some way to Kirtland, Ohio, I would be technically accurate, but I would also be misleading if I were trying to teach that there were ancient Egyptians in Kirtland, Ohio. Right. It's ridiculous. And you see these guys play with their language this way. And I just want every listener to understand it's dishonest. When you withhold information and you paint things prettier than they are, so as to have the listener think like, oh, wow, what an incredible evidence. Here is Abraham's name and the other words around it say he's on the couch. This is a bullseye. When in reality, it is not. And it's so far distant from what they want it to be that it ends up really being almost nothing. Yeah, and I'll tell you on a personal note, uh, when this came out originally in a Farms Bulletin, um, and Farms was the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, which most of the people listening know, it's now the Neil A. Maxwell Institute. When it came out, I was very excited by it. I thought this is the smoking gun. This is huge evidence. But unfortunately, once again, as with so many of these bullseyes, you dig a little bit deeper and it starts becoming weaker and weaker. And then you find apologists overstating it and probably knowingly overstating it, saying it says what it doesn't say, and then things just start falling apart from there. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I think absolutely what you have here is nothing being put out as something and then it being just embellished over and over again. And at some point, we have to call these guys out. They're not honest. Um, let's move on to the next one. I thought this was an interesting find by you. One of the other evidences presented. So now we're on the, the fourth uh, kind of evidence that Egyptologists in the church, Kerry Molstein, John Gee, and maybe then re re-emphasized by people like Mike Ash and Daniel C. Peterson, is this idea that there are concepts uh, in the book of Abraham, uh, canonical texts that we have in the, in the Pearl of Great Price. So in that book of Abraham, there are ideas of what Abraham is doing, um, where he's going, who he's interacting with. And then uh, LDS Egyptologists will then say like, wait a minute, we have other uh, stories and documents that we now have that show that, look, Joseph is hitting a bullseye again. He is portraying Abraham in places, doing things that these documents also have connections to. Uh, RFM, help us understand why this one doesn't hold up. Okay, well, unfortunately, the reason that apologists, including Daniel C. Peterson and others, you don't have to be an Egyptologist to engage in this type of analysis, go to trying to look for parallels in the book of Abraham text with ancient parallels is once again because the book of Abraham doesn't match the papyrus. If it did, that would be the end of it. Case closed. But once again, we get further and further afield trying to prop up the inspiration and the revelation and the translation behind the book of Abraham. And this is just another way of doing that. Now, if there were actual ancient stories that are reflected in the book of Abraham that Joseph Smith would have had no way of knowing about, well, I would have to admit, yes, that would speak to the inspiration of Joseph Smith in producing the book of Abraham, even if he thought he was translating the papyrus and wasn't, and yet is somehow producing a text with stories in it about Abraham that were known anciently, but not known in modern times, you know, that would be impressive. And that is the attempt to do what you're talking about. In fact, there's this massive book, and I mentioned it in part one, it's called Traditions About the Early Life of Abraham. This is the one that was compiled and edited by John Twetness, 
John Gee, Egyptologist, and Brian Hauglid, the one who has uh, changed camps from the Lost Scroll camp of John Gee to the, apparently to the Catalyst Theory, though I'm not exactly sure where he is now, but he certainly left that Lost Scroll camp far behind him. Let me give you an example. There are two primary stories about Abraham that are not in the Bible, but are produced in the book of Abraham as we have it, that are reflected in ancient texts. The first of these is the sacrifice of Abraham himself. We all know from the Bible that it wasn't Abraham who was sacrificed. It was Abraham who was commanded to sacrifice his son Isaac, and that was uh, interrupted by the intercession of an angel right at the critical moment. But the Bible says nothing about Abraham himself having been attempted to be sacrificed. There are, however, ancient texts and stories about the sacrifice of Abraham. And once again, it's an attempted sacrifice of Abraham. These, however, do not involve a sacrifice with a knife by an Egyptian priest. Instead, they involve a sacrifice by being thrown into a fire. And the story very much resembles that of um, the three Hebrew children who were thrown into the fire, as we find it in the, uh, the book of Daniel. This would be Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, right? Yes, or as my Aunt Jeannie used to say when she was a kid, uh, and she didn't do it intentionally, she said, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. <laughs> but that's just a little family story there, trying to make Radio Free Mormon a little more personable here to the audience. But anyway, the story, and this was actually a rather famous story anciently about the attempted sacrifice of Abraham being thrown into the fire and being preserved by the Lord. Now, the problem is, Bill, the problem is that if that were only in ancient texts that were unavailable to Joseph Smith, and then it shows up in the book of Abraham, even though it's a different kind of sacrifice, you know, we could probably give a little room for error there. But the problem is, is that that story is not only an ancient text unavailable to Joseph Smith, but it's also in a text that was very much available to Joseph Smith. And what I'm referring to there is the book of Jasher. The book of Jasher seems to have some interest to Latter-day Saints. At least when I joined the church back in the 1970s and on into the 1980s, many members of the church had a copy of the book of Jasher on their bookshelves. It is an apocryphal book. It is referenced in the Old Testament as the book of Jasher. And apparently somebody came along and decided to write a book that matched the citation in the Old Testament. But at any rate, there is a book of Jasher. It was available to Joseph Smith. And in the book of Jasher, it mentions the story of the attempted sacrifice of Abraham. Once again, it's by his being thrown into the fire. Once again, he comes out alive. Once again, he's saved by an angel of the Lord. And once again, he is bound by linen cords. So the differences are that it's into fire and not by being cut with a knife, as in fact, simile number one. The other difference is that it's not being done by a priest of Pharaoh. It's being done by Nimrod, who is the king not of Egypt, but of Babylon. Now, we'll get into this a little bit later because Ur, where this all takes place, is in Babylon. It's not in Egypt. And that's going to be another problem for the book of Abraham, which we'll talk about later. But right now, what I want to talk about is the fact that the book of Jasher was extremely popular in Joseph Smith's day. It was completely available to him. And this would be the likely source for Joseph Smith's understanding that a story existed about Abraham being attempted to be sacrificed in Ur of the Chaldees. And once again, the Chaldees just means in Babylon, in the land or city of Ur in Babylon, and probably for its appearance in the book of Abraham. Now, the second thing, the second uh, big hit that appears in the book of Abraham is where it talks about Abraham going to Egypt ultimately and sitting on Pharaoh's throne and teaching the principles of astronomy to the Egyptian court of Pharaoh. And actually the text of Abraham never gets to that. It sort of 
cuts off in the middle. It appears that maybe there was more that would come and it never did. But if you go to facsimile number three, facsimile number three illustrates a scene that one would expect to have been in the text of the book of Abraham if it had been completed, but which never was. If you look at facsimile number three, you'll see there's six explanations underneath it. Figure one says that Abraham is sitting upon Pharaoh's throne and at the very bottom of the figures uh, and the explanations of the figures, it says this, Abraham is reasoning upon the principles of astronomy in the king's court. So that's how the book of Abraham preserves the idea that Abraham taught the principles of astronomy in the king's court. In other words, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That story is also a bullseye because that story also appears in a number of ancient texts. Once again, like the book of Jasher, however, that story appears not only in ancient texts that were unavailable to Joseph Smith, but it also appears in another text that was very much available to Joseph Smith, and that was in Josephus. Now, Josephus is, oh, it's a series of books, actually. It was compiled by a Jewish historian. He lived in the first century, and um, he compiled a history of his people going back to creation, going back and basically recapitulating much of the Old Testament, then taking it down through the Maccabees and up through what were to him modern times with the Romans and the destruction of the temple under Titus in approximately 70 CE or the Common Era, which is during the time that Josephus lived. So having said all of that, Josephus, of course, talks about Abraham in the first part of his history because, as I said, he's recapitulating the Old Testament, or I should say the Hebrew Scriptures, and also adding in other stories that didn't make it into the Hebrew Scriptures. And one of those stories is, guess what? Abraham reasoning upon the principles of astronomy to Pharaoh. So this is what he says in chapter 8. I think it's of his first book that it's talking about uh, the Egyptians, it's talking about Abraham, and it says he communicated to them arithmetic and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abraham came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning, for that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt and from thence to the Greeks also. So Josephus is the likely source, or at least it's a contemporary and available source to Joseph Smith for putting it into the book of Abraham. Josephus was not simply available in Joseph Smith's day. Uh, there is documented history in the church that Oliver Cowdery, I believe, had a copy of Josephus. So not only was it theoretically available to Joseph Smith, it was very close by and readily available to Joseph Smith. So my question would be, has the church made any kind of acknowledgement, RFM, on whether uh, this may have played a part in the book of Abraham? You're cracking me up with that one, Bill. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the softball right across the plate. Yes, the church actually has, but you have to dig and dig and dig to find it. You know that the church put up the essay on the book of Abraham. I think it was in 2014 on the church website. So if you go to that essay, and I encourage you to do so, what you're going to find is that it's rather lengthy. It mentions some of these uh, bullseyes, and I'll have to put that in quotation marks, unfortunately, um, as well as maybe some other, which are even worse than the ones we've talked about. And then there are certain footnotes that are mentioned because they also go to these stories that are talked about and the connection with the ancient world. Now, this essay has 46 footnotes. And at the very end, the last sentence, actually the last two sentences of the last footnote, if you look really close and put on your reading specs, Bill, you will find this in the fine print. Quote, some of these extra biblical elements were available to Joseph Smith through the books of Jasher and Josephus, period. That's what they hide at the very end of the last footnote of the essay on the church website. Now, they do add this 
This is the very last sentence. After saying some of these extra biblical elements were available to Joseph Smith through the books of Jasher and Josephus, they add this apologetic note. Joseph Smith was aware of these books. Oh my gosh, they actually say he was aware of these books. This isn't looking good, Bill. They say Joseph Smith was aware of these books, but it is unknown whether he utilized them. Do you, do you mind if I pipe in here? No, go ahead. Uh, here's, what bob- here's what bothers me. They Once you say, look... Joseph Smith was definitely aware of them. He's aware of these books. There's there's no ifs, ands, or buts. And that's what the church is saying here. He was aware of these books. But whether he used them or not in the translation of the book of Abraham, that we can't say. That we don't know. Um, what I would say is that when you recognize the church acknowledging this much, you are not even a hop, skip, and a jump away from what Joseph Smith did here, being very similar to what he did with Adam Clark's commentary. Yes, and we know from the Adam Clark commentary and the Joseph Smith translation and Joseph Smith's use of the former in creating the latter, that he was very, very open to using modern sources in order to help him with his translations. I think that's probably the nicest way I could put it and incorporating elements from currently existing texts that he had with him into his newly created scripture. He did it with the Joseph Smith uh, translation of the Bible. We know that now. And so it is not too much of a stretch to think that he would have been likely to do the same thing with other scriptural productions, including the book of Abraham. Yeah. And so this footnote, here's the other thing I'm very curious of. Was this footnote there? So, so it seems odd. It's number 46. It's the last one. My, I'm wondering to myself if we were able to go back to a cached copy of this um, from when this essay was first put out. My gut tells me I don't remember there being 46 footnotes, like much less. Um, and it feels, and again, I could be, I could be just guessing, maybe I'm wrong. Somebody out there is going to help us out because somebody knows how to do this to go in and find old copies of things on websites. But I'm curious what the footnotes were to begin with and at which point, uh, footnote number 46 shows up. Well, it's hard to tell you're right, Bill. And that's one of the beauties of publishing an essay in the format that the church has chosen to do with no date of publication, no authors described, and it can be changed at any point without anybody else being the wiser unless they have a copy of it before it was changed and are, for whatever reason, looking for it. Yeah, so interesting. Let me tell you this one last apologetic trick, and I've seen this even recently in researching for this particular podcast, Bill. Here's the great... Uh, apologist trick is what you do is you use these stories from Josephus or the book of Jasher that occur in the book of Abraham. And what you do is you don't quote Josephus or Jasher. Instead, you quote other iterations of the same story in different texts that were not available to Joseph Smith. And then you say, how could Joseph Smith have known? These stories are in texts that were not available to to him, and yet here they appear in the book of Abraham. Yeah, and I don't want to get into saying it here, telling the story again, but for listeners who have been following your podcast, it reminds me a lot of Daniel C. Peterson's um, issue with Alma, where he pretends like Alma is this uh, historically female name, but he has this old world source of it being a male name, but he ignores the fact, as you pointed out, that Alma was also used in our modern, uh, you know, 1800s in the United States as a male name as well. Right. You leave out the fact that Joseph Smith was aware of it being a male name. You focus only on the idea that it's a female name because it's Alma comes from, I think, what, Latin uh, fostering mother, alma mater. It's, that's usually the uh, the thing that Daniel C. Peterson says. And then after having established that it was a female name only, then looking at the the land deed that was discovered, I think, in 1968 by Yigel Yadin in a dig in Israel, where Alma is mentioned as a male name. That is much a stronger evidence for the Book of Mormon if you don't mention the fact which Daniel C. Peterson scrupulously avoids mentioning that Alma was also a male name known to Joseph Smith in his community. 
Yeah. And so I want to simply say here what you just pointed out, which is when you hold back the facts, and as we get into this next section, uh, where we talk about what John Gee and Kerry Molstein have said about how they handle uh, these issues when they're talking to people and the assumptions that they make, you'll begin to understand that their very framework, they're admitting out in the open that their framework requires them to hold back facts when those facts aren't faith promoting. Um, and so if you don't have anything else you want to cover here, I know we still want to talk about the geography. We'll get to that at the end. We also promised listeners that we were going to share uh, some new insight, which we'll do too at the end. But now I want to jump into these audio clips unless you've got something else you want to cover at this point. No, that's fine. Let's go to that. Great. So let's start off with John Gee. Uh, John Gee is an Egyptologist. If I'm not mistaken, I think he got his uh, got his Egyptology degree from Yale, and that's impressive. It's very impressive, and it has to be pointed out right now. His professor at Yale was Robert Rittner. Yeah, and that's crucial because Robert Rittner uh, is on the record. And what Robert Rittner is not just an Egyptologist. The gentleman is a renowned Egyptologist. When other Egyptologists are asked about issues connected to Mormonism, they all point everybody back to Robert Rittner. Um, so this guy is a renowned Egypt Egyptologist. And on the other hand, when you go out outside of Mormonism and start asking Egyptologists about their regard for John Gee and Kerry Molstein, it's the opposite of that. And I will play a clip here at some point uh, that will speak to that. But let's start off with John Gee. So John Gee, Egyptologist, faithful Mormon, believes uh, in the missing scroll theory. And here is what he says about uh, how he handles this material. Thus, it is not surprising that one proponent of these interreligious dialogues conducted under the auspices of religious studies warned, quote, against the tendency of some Mormon scholars to play the role of orthodoxy police within the faith. Policing orthodoxy is presumably a bad thing. Those who wish to blur the boundaries see those who wish to maintain the boundaries as a threat. Nevertheless, there is a reason for the boundaries in the first place and for those who police the boundaries. I have long used a different metaphor. Defending the faith is a lot like having a job diffusing landmines. <laughs> the job is to protect others, but one never knows if a new bomb is instead going to blow up on the one trying to defuse it. Unfortunately, I know a number of casualties. From this perspective, those who think that participating in academia gives one a license to experience with any and all pyrotechnics are dangerous to themselves and to others. Continuing the metaphor, much as we might marvel at an individual's abilities of seeing how many live hand grenades he can juggle, doing so is, irresponsibly, is irresponsible. And the juggler almost never takes responsibility when the grenades start flying off and going off in the audience. Some even appear to enjoy the resulting chaos and carnage. If that metaphor seems a little extreme, considering the following statement by Elder Boyd K. Packer, quote, one who chooses to follow the tenets of his profession, regardless of how they may injure the church or destroy the faith of those not ready for advanced history, is himself in spiritual jeopardy. If that one is a member of the church, he has broken his covenants and will be accountable. And I want to say in all seriousness that there is a limit to the patience of the Lord with respect to those who are under covenant to bless and protect his church and kingdom upon the earth, but do not do it. Or consider the more recent counsel of Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. Quote, to lead a child or anyone else, even inadvertently away from faithfulness, away from loyalty and bedrock belief, simply because we want to be clever or independent, is license no parent nor any other person has ever been given. In matters of religion, a skeptical mind is not a higher manifestation of virtue than is a believing heart, and analytical deconstruction in the field of, say, literary fiction 
can be just plain old-fashioned destruction when transferred to families yearning for faith at home, and such a deviation from the true course can be deceptively slow and subtle in its impact. First off, notice that he says that it's his job as an Egyptologist, because he's a member of the church, to police the boundaries of orthodoxy. He is the orthodoxy police, which means that he is going to interpret everything he gets in Egyptology in support of the Book of Abraham and its authenticity. He's already shown that he is a biased judge. Now, in his mind, that's a positive thing, but he has shown that he is completely biased and that everything that he studies, he is going to use to support the Book of Abraham. Regardless of what other Egyptologists think about it, and regardless of what he as an Egyptologist would think about it if he were not also committed to policing the orthodoxy of Mormonism. He then quotes Boyd K. Packer approvingly from Boyd K. Packer's talk in the early 1980s, which I did my first episode on, which was the mantle is far, far greater than the intellect in which Boyd K. Packer states and encourages and basically threatens every single teacher and scholar in the church that there are facts that are not useful, that there are facts and history in the LDS church that hurt faith, that lessen faith, that are not faith promoting, and that those facts should never be talked about, should never be written about, should never be mentioned by LDS scholars. Only the faith promoting facts, only that side of the story is what is supposed to be mentioned according to Boyd K. Packer's talk that John Gee quotes here. So John Gee is totally in the camp of Boyd K. Packer that we already know from the outset that when he's talking about the book of Abraham as an Egyptologist, he is going to follow Boyd K. Packer's counsel. And he's only going to tell us the faith-promoting part and all the stuff that's not faith-promoting, he's not going to mention at all. By the way, that is John Gee from this past August, 2018, speaking at the Fair Mormon Conference. Your thoughts, Bill? So he says this, he gives this analogy, because I like this analogy better. And he talks about somebody who's diffusing landmines. Um, and what he does is he says, look, whenever we were diffusing landmines, we run the risk of blowing up ourselves and blowing up others. But the question you have to ask is, what are the landmines? And it seems, if you were to listen to it again, I'll just let the listener do that. Go back and, and go back two or three minutes and listen to it again. What he's saying is that the landmines are the facts, the data, and the scholarship. And so while we as smart people and, and informed people, you and me, Radio Free Mormon, we know Mormonism inside and out. We've read all of this stuff. And so as we look at saying like when we were active and in the church and we're wanting to share like new ideas and new information and scholarship and facts and data and help people correct their false assumptions and help people get rid of the false faith promoting stories and put other stories in their life that have more truth to them. What he's saying is like, don't do that. You're going to hurt people's faith. You're going to blow yourself up. And what he's essentially saying is we have taken permission to withhold facts from you, to withhold data from you, because if we gave you, as Packer says, the advanced history, such would not build your faith. In fact, it would hurt your faith. And when you understand that analogy that John Gee uses, you now understand why Carrie Molstein talks about this love spell being Abraham on the couch when that's not what it says. Or when these guys start using facts like uh, the book of this or the book of that, which Joseph Smith wouldn't have had access to, like you get the reason why these guys feel blatant permission to lie and to be dishonest. So this idea of the landmines, and then he moves into hand grenades and juggling them. And then he uses the Packer quote and says that, you know, when we, when we use advanced history and it's not faith promoting, like we're breaking covenants, you can begin to sense the immense amount of pressure. And I'll add this too. The, the talk that Packer gave was kind of off in this corner. And all of us as uh, informed Mormons know of the talk. But the talk isn't in the cultural milieu of orthodox correlated Mormonism. 
it's only in this other sphere. And I have to wonder how often this talk is used behind the scenes to give blatant permission to the uh, defenders of the faith to go ahead and do whatever you have to do, whether it is deceive, whether it is shade the facts, whether it is withhold information, whether it is only give that information. Meanwhile, the other piece hurts it. It feels like these guys are lying for the Lord, which is another statement here from church history and tied in some ways to President Packer. Lying for the Lord seems to be okay with these guys as long as they're lying doesn't hurt faith and in fact builds it. I think that's an excellent point, Bill. Adding to that, John Gee is talking about these hand grenades, you know, and juggling hand grenades. And these things can go off and they can blow your head off or they can fly off on the audience and start blowing people up in the audience. What are the hand grenades he's talking about, Bill? It's the data and the facts and the truth. These are the explosive pieces of history and Egyptology that John Gee knows perfectly well that would blow up what it is he's trying to defend. It's obvious that's what it is. He's taught these are the these are Boyd K. Packer's facts that are not useful. Well, in John Gee's analogy, these are facts that are explosive and blow up in your face. And this is something that should not be done by the regular member. So, you know, he's saying, hey, this is for professionals only. So don't you be worrying your pretty little heads about it. We're the Egyptologists. We're the ones with the degrees. We're the ones with all the learning. Just let us worry about it. You guys shouldn't touch it because you might blow yourself up and you might even blow somebody else up while you're at it. It's ex- and it's ex- extremely patronizing attitude toward the audience. But there's a reason behind it and it's because he knows that if the people find out what the real Egyptology is and what the real Egyptologists think, that he doesn't have a leg to stand on. So it's just another way, like the church is always trying to keep people away from the internet and finding out more about Mormonism and we hear those talks in general conference. This is John Gee's version of trying to keep the members away from Egyptology by threatening them with it being something that would blow up in their face as a hand grenade might when they're juggling it. So you stay away from that, let us handle it. And if you don't know what's, okay. And what you don't know won't hurt you. Yeah. So when my shelf came down, my shelf came down over the fact that I, for the first time, a light bulb went on and I realized the church was intentionally withholding things from me. It wasn't the fact that the history was messy. I I could deal with that. It was that the church didn't want me to know the messy history. What John Gee is saying here, what, and he's reiterating Boyd K. Packer, who was saying it as well, is that we don't trust the members of the church to know um, these data points, these facts, these truths, because it's going to hurt their faith. And so we, knowing better than them, are going to keep these out of view. Now I'm going to ask the listener, do you want to know the facts or do you want somebody to assume on your behalf that you can't handle them? And what John Gee is openly admitting here is that these facts in the book of Abraham, they're going to hurt your faith. So we're going to whitewash them. We're going to withhold them. We're not going to even tell you some of them. We're going to portray them differently than what they really are. And we feel like we have permission to do that because these facts could hurt you. And I'll tell you, RFM, I hate being lied to more than anything else. I hate being lied to. And John Gee is openly admitting here that Mormon apologists withhold the truth and shade the truth so that the people in that audience at Fair Mormon don't get hurt. Absolutely. And then he goes on to quote Elder Holland. And he quotes Elder Holland because what Elder Holland is saying is the same thing in a different context. What Elder Holland is saying is that parents and their own children, Bill, that parents do not have any license to talk to their children and share information with them in such a way that it would detract from their loyalty to the church and their faith in the church. He says that that is a license that no parent has ever been given. Well, Elder Holland, can I ask you something? 
Who the heck is it that gives license to parents to teach their children what the parent thinks is appropriate? Is that you, Elder Holland? Are you the guy who's in charge of the licenses? Because I didn't know there was a license here. Maybe I haven't studied Mormon history enough, but apparently there's a licensing department bill and you have to get a license to teach your children what the church thinks they should be taught. In church, we like to give the rhetoric that families are first, parents have the primary responsibility to teach their children, but the reality is when you start to understand these hidden messages that are put on us in subtle uh, and unconscious ways as we grow up in the church and as we live in the church, we, we ought to come to the understanding that what Elder Holland is pointing at is that in reality, while we like to give uh, lip service to the idea that it is parents who have the primary responsibility for teaching in the home or teaching the children, the reality is the church is also saying, no, 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 not really. Really, it's up to us. And you parents ought to, when you think you should do one thing or another, you ought to look to us and do what we're asking you to do and not do it the way you want to. Oh, absolutely. The church, I think, is very clear that the the parents are in charge of teaching the children, but with the caveat that what the parents are to teach the children is what the church tells the parents they can teach the children. Yeah. And, And when you start to see the unhealthiness and abusiveness of that kind of message, like you don't have a right to tell your kids the facts if the facts destroy their testimony of the church because the facts literally do destroy the te- their testimony in the church, then then suddenly you recognize like, oh, look at the game these guys play. And, and I'll simply leave it there, but I will say this soundbite from John Gee is damning to the church. Oh yeah, he has picked uh, two of perhaps the most offensive quotes that he could from general authorities, from Boyd K. Packer and from Elder Holland in order to give license to himself to do exactly what it is that he's doing, which I personally find ethically questionable. So the next one here is Kerry Molstein. And Kerry Molstein, now, now keep in mind, he's an Egyptologist. And he is talking to members of the church and saying, look, I'm an Egyptologist. And knowing Egyptology, Egyptology doesn't hurt at all my testimony of the church. And in fact, here's my Egyptology expertise, and it actually gives me added insight that builds my testimony. But that's not what Kerry Molstein says on this occasion. So here's the soundbite from him. Uh, But what I really like to spend my time on is how important the beginning premise or the beginning assumption is that people make. And often we don't realize this. Uh, And it's what frequently causes disagreement. Uh, among people who are of different faiths or of no faith at all because they don't realize what their beginning assumptions are. So let me use an analogy that may be useful. Um, for a, And I'm not a physicist. I'm going to use a physics analysis. If uh, someone here is a physicist and can uh, tell me that I'm incorrect, I'd like to know that. But for a long time, there was an assumption that uh, anything in the universe, we had either particles or we had waves. Um, and something could not be both a particle and a wave. That was an assumption that we went with for a long time. And then, uh, with further research, we found that light had some characteristics of particles and some characteristics of waves. Now, if someone were so dedicated to that original assumption that something is either a particle or a wave, they are now in the position where they will have to disallow certain kinds of evidence. If they are sure that that light is a wave and it can't also have characteristics of a particle, any evidence that suggests it is a particle has to be explained away. Similarly, if you're sure it's a wave, or I mean a, a particle, you'll explain away evidence that it's a wave. I think this is a little bit akin to our assumptions about the validity of revelation as a source of knowledge. There are many people in the world who are certain that that is not a valid source of knowledge. Uh, And beginning with that assumption, then anything having to do with the Restoration and Joseph Smith as a prophet has to be discarded. They have to ignore any evidence that would support that. 
Uh, and I've seen this happen. I've seen um, people who are critical of Joseph Smith when something uh, comes up that kind of supports uh, something he had translated through inspiration. I've, I've seen emails where they say, well, that can't be true. He couldn't have actually known that, even though it seems that he knew it. That's their attempt to explain things away because it doesn't fit in with their beginning assumption. So I'd like to be clear about my beginning assumption. I believe Revelation is a valid source of knowledge. Uh, we should pursue things with our mind, but we should also pursue it with the part of our mind that listens to the Holy Ghost. And so I start out with an assumption that the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon and anything else <coughs> excuse me, that we get from uh, the restored gospel is true. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I don't feel that I need to defend that paradigm. I feel that I want to understand the evidence that I find within that paradigm because to me it's a given that it's true. There are others who will assume that it's not true and on these points we'll just have to agree to disagree, but we will understand one another better when we understand how our beginning assumptions uh, color the way we, we filter all of the evidence that we find. So that <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I, don't e I think, again, listeners, I'm going to challenge you. When, we, when RFM and I get done talking about this segment, go back and listen to it again. Um, I will make sure in the footnotes to this episode that you also have uh, the links to get to these pieces of audio. Uh, here's the trouble. So first, he talks about this idea of particles and waves. And it's actually a fascinating piece of science in physics, um, this idea that, that both, they could be both particles and waves, but that forever we thought that was one or the other. It could only be particles or it could only be waves. And again, getting into the physics of this, I would recommend people go read. It's so fascinating. But let's get back to Molstein. Here's what he does. He uses that analogy... And then he makes two really uh, bad arguments that are uh, in contradiction with each other. And then he shows himself to be a hypocrite with these on his own words about his assumption. So he starts off saying, like some people, those critics, those critics are so dedicated to their assumption that they don't leave any room that they could be wrong and that new facts could come in and could change their mind. This is wrong on two levels. One is that he, as he says in his last part of this quote, he is overly dedicated to his assumption. He's already said like those critics, their weakness is they're so dedicated to their assumption. And then he goes, but let me tell you how dedicated I am to my assumption. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is the idea that he kind of opens up this door saying like, look, if people are dedicated to their assumption... And they're not open to the fact that there might be some new information out there somewhere that'll be discovered a decade from now, and then it might change their mind. And hence, they should prepare themselves now to allow that assumption to maybe even change before the new data comes out. That's not the way human beings work. Human beings work this way. We form an assumption. We test that assumption through our lives. If it's not a science experiment, maybe it's us just going to school and dealing with friendships and peers and, and teachers and football coaches and parents. And, and as we deal with life and we take our first job and we learn what things work and what things don't work, we start off with assumptions. New data comes in. We realize certain things work and certain things don't work. And the, the experience of life is that when we recognize that what we're doing is not producing the result we're looking for, we make changes. What Carrie's doing here is saying there is some unknown evidence out there somewhere. And these critics, they have these assumptions so hard and fast that they're not open to the unknown evidence that nobody knows about that hasn't come out yet. And that's irrational. It's illogical. Well, and, then he, and then he furthers this, and I, and I hope I make this clear. He furthers this then by telling you what his assumption is, and his assumption is that the church is true. And what he's going to do then is take every bit and piece and particle of evidence, and he's going to force it like a square peg into a round hole. He's going to force it to fit 
into his assumption. And he's not, he's not even open to the evidence that exists because he's already made his assumption and he's criticizing the critic for not being open to us to evidence and information that hasn't even come forward yet. He is so intellectually dishonest. And if I'm honest at this moment, I have to say like on some level, he comes off looking like a moron because the logical fallacies, the circular reasoning and the intellectual dishonesty needed in his quote to uphold that requires me to be the village idiot to accept it as truth. Well, I will tell you that um, what I hear him saying is similar to what you hear him saying. Mainly, he states at the outset, and this is to his credit, by the way, um, everybody has assumptions of some sort, some stronger than others. Uh, It's a good thing to be able to identify our, our assumptions at the outset, not so that we cling to them mindlessly in spite of what the evidence is, which is what he apparently does, Bill, but so that we can take them into account when we're evaluating evidence. In other words, am I having this reaction to new evidence because of objective thoughts or is it because of my assumptions that I hold previously? And if it's because of my assumptions, well, then maybe I should approach that evidence differently and try and be more objective about it. That's the purpose of identifying our assumptions. But what he says is that some people get so locked into their positions that they will disallow new evidence. They won't even consider new evidence. And he talks about it as if it's a bad thing when it's a critic of the book of Abraham. But when he's a proponent of the book of Abraham, suddenly it becomes a virtue. So he is a person who will disallow new evidence because he has already started with the assumption. uh, He started with the conclusion, actually, that the book of Abraham is an authentic translation of an ancient Egyptian document. And this is why he has to put himself in the position of a missing scroll theory. I don't know if John Gee feels the same way. It's likely he does, that they have the same idea. They start with the conclusion, which is, of course, the scientific method, as you know, Bill. You start with your conclusion already in hand, and then every new piece of evidence that you encounter, you force into the conclusion that you started with. That's the way we arrive at truth in the scientific world. But what Kerry Muelstein is saying is, I already know what the truth is. Even before I started studying Egyptology, I was raised a good Mormon boy. I learned in Sunday school and in young men's that the book of Abraham is true. The restoration is true. And now I'm going to go get an Egyptology degree to prove it. This is really what he did. I don't know if it's what John Gee did. I suspect it is. But they go out now to prove it. And instead of reacting honestly to the facts, which apparently Brian Haugla did, which is why he left that camp a few years ago and announced it last month on Facebook that he's left the Missing Scroll camp because he's reacting honestly to the evidence. He and Muelstein have taken a cottage by the side of the road together where they've put up soundproofing on the walls, they've blacked out the windows, and they don't allow any new evidence to come in that would disrupt the harmony and peace of their religious conclusions. He's doing the very thing he's criticizing the critic for doing, and he's even doing it stronger, number one. Number two, when he says the the critic's not open to new evidence, RFM, what new evidence? We have diced and sliced every single piece of evidence these guys suggest, and they don't even address these things honestly. Like, what new evidence is the critic supposed to consider? Well, apparently those are the hand grenades that John Gee's talking about juggling. That, that they won't even tell us because they're damaging to faith. This is such a joke. Second, when he says, um, or when he says that we need to acknowledge our assumptions, as you point out, the reason we should be acknowledging our assumptions is to avoid, to do our best to avoid bias, to be as objective as possible. But then he goes on to admit, like, no, 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 that's not how I do it. I get get my conclusion. I felt some elevation emotion. I know the church is true. And so, darn it, I'll make everything fit into that conclusion. And it doesn't matter what's said. If if it really is damning, I'll avoid it, dismiss it, deflect it. Uh, I'll change the question. I'll figure out some way around it. I'll, you know, leave it in the box and not take it out to show everybody. 
but I, no matter what, I know the church is true. I will fit everything into that. uh, And it doesn't matter come hell or high water, what kind of evidence comes out. These guys to be taken seriously, it's a joke. And unfortunately, Kerry Muelstein has shown that not only will he twist the facts to fit his theory, he'll even alter the facts when it comes to saying that the Amherst papyri, the magical papyri, shows Abraham being the person on the couch. Yeah, it's a lie. These guys lie. So for listeners, for listeners who are trying to understand the book of Abraham, you have to ask yourself, which side wants you to look at all the available information and to make a decision and which side wants you to only see selected pieces and parts because they know which conclusion's right and damn it, it's all going to fit in that conclusion. If it doesn't, it's going to get discarded. Who's being honest with you? Who's being truthful? Guy already acknowledges, like, I, I'm happy to lie to you if it's faith building. I'm happy to withhold information from you. I, I'm not going to give you a grenade because I know what's going to happen. I want the truth. I want the full story. I want to he- read from both sides. I want all the available information. And I want both sides to trust me enough to give me that info so I can make the best decision for me. And I don't need Elder Holland determining beforehand what information is best for me to have and which information is not, because I'm not going to be treated like a child anymore. And once again, I'm going to repeat this now. I said it in part one, but it bears repeating now. There have been books and books and books and articles and articles and articles, thousands of pages written by LDS scholars about the book of Abraham. And 95% of it has nothing to do with the issues in the book of Abraham. And when I say those thousands and thousands of pages, I mean, obviously, I think that they are trying to defend and support the ancientness and authenticity of the book of Abraham. But 95% of what's in there has nothing to do with it. It is all a distraction. It is all talking about other things. And it is done so continuously and incessantly that it leads me to think that the distraction is intentional. So knowing all of that, let's go back to what Brian Hoglid said again. Um, And I want to read his quote one more time. So now that we've shown that Kerry Molstein is dishonest and deceptive and that John Gee has acknowledged with his words that he is also dishonest and deceptive. So I hope the listeners get that. John Gee says, I have no problem lying and withholding information from members of the church if that information is going to hurt their testimony. And Kerry Molstein, by the very things that he points to as evidence and deceivingly portrays them as something they're not, both of them have essentially either lied or tell you they have no problem with lying about this stuff. So now knowing that, And knowing all the deceptiveness that goes into the things that they have said, listen to Brian Hoglid one more time. He said, quote, for the record, I no longer hold the views that have been quoted from my 2010 book in these, in there, the Dan Vogel videos. I have moved on from my days as an outrageous apologist. In fact, I'm no longer interested or involved in apologetics in any way. I wholeheartedly agree with Dan Vogel's excellent assessment of the Abraham Egyptian documents in these videos. I now reject a missing Abraham manuscript. I agree that two of the Abraham manuscripts were simultaneously dictated. I agree with the Egyptian papers that they were used to produce the book of Abraham. I agree that only Abraham 1 uh, 1 through 218 were produced in 1835 and that Abraham 219 uh, 219 through 521 were produced in Nauvoo and on and on now here it is I no longer agree with Guy or Molstein I find their apologetic quote scholarship unquote on the book of Abraham abhorrent abhorrent. Why? Because these guys are lying and they're deceptive and they justify their reasons for lying. And they even tell you right to your face. One can find, this is back to to a Huglid. One can find that I've changed my mind in my recent and forthcoming publications, the most recent Joseph Smith papers, Revelations and Translation, Volume 4, the Book of Abraham and related manuscripts now on the shelves is much more open to Dan Vogel's thinking on the origin of the book of Abraham. 
what's Dan Vogel's thinking? That the book of Abraham is made up by Joseph Smith, that it is a fraud. That's Dan Vogel's perspective. He's an outsider critic who says, yeah, Joseph may have been thinking at times he was doing the right thing. He didn't do what Mormonism claimed he did. He made it up in his head. So back again to Hoglid. My friend Brent Metcalf can attest to my transformative journey. Brian couldn't be any more point blank with the words that he used there. He is saying the games that Guy and Molstein play to uphold this missing papyrus theory is bullcrap. And he no longer stands for it. And he sees through it. And he no longer holds this ground. Yes, and I know that you have interviewed Brian Hauglid on your program at Mormon Discussions podcast previously, and I would really, really hope that Brian might be willing to come on to your program and be interviewed and find out exactly what he means by this and what specific instances he's referring to when he says that their quote-unquote scholarship is abhorrent. Let's wrap up with one last piece of audio This is Robin Scott Jensen. Robin Scott Jensen worked with Brian Hoglid on the Joseph Smith Papers Project. He saw the same evidence and data that compelled Brian to make this statement that we just read to you. Once you understand that, you'll understand little twists and turns in Robin Scott Jensen's comment, which essentially he is asking us, And he's acknowledging, he's acknowledging first, we were told a certain story. We were told that Joseph was doing something and we imposed that. And now all of us as Latter-day Saints are going to have to get comfortable with something different. Here's Robin Scott Jensen. The question then is, what do we make of those translations? Because that's a fairly obvious translation. And that's where questions still are being raised. I think that going back to my earlier analogy about the parent praying for the sick child, we have the real possibility that through historical evidence that Joseph Smith believes that he is translating from the papyri. There's enough evidence to suggest that he really does think that. So Joseph Smith received revelation for the text of the book of Abraham. He may have, through that revelation, also made assumptions about where that text came from. It could be that Joseph Smith assumed that he was translating from the papyri when he was not, in fact, Mm. translating from the papyri. We don't know in the revelatory process how much of this is Joseph Smith and how much of it is the divine. Sometimes we think of Joseph Smith as a fax machine for the Lord. The divine stenographer for God. Yeah, yeah. that, that God has this text, pushes a button, and it goes through Joseph Smith completely and totally unfiltered. I think in some cases that might be true. Members of the church can believe that, yeah, that that could be true. That might happen. I think, though, we also need to recognize that there is an agency factor in translation, in revelation, in, in prophethood. Joseph Smith often gave sermons to members of the church that when he was speaking as a man, he was just speaking as a man. When he was speaking as a prophet, he was speaking as a prophet. Sometimes those two, though, blend together. Mm. The and line becomes fuzzy where, where yeah, that starts yeah. and ends. With these explanations in particular, how much of that is inspired? How much of that is Joseph Smith's cultural assumptions? We don't know. And that is where people can often say, well, it's easy. Joseph Smith is a fraud. Right. He claimed this translation. It's a very cynical, yeah. skeptical view yeah. of it. Right. If you have certain assumptions about translation, I can see where you could make that statement. But I think this is where we, we as a church really need to understand translation and the revelatory process a little bit better. It's a little bit more messy than right. we make it out in Sunday school. And that's okay. Yeah. It can be messy. It can be complex. It can be nuanced. So let's go through this. First, Robin Scott Jensen acknowledges that the evidence is there that Joseph is working from the papyri that we have in our possession. So let's stop. Robin Scott Jensen is working with the church in the church's historical department on the Joseph Smith Papers Project on the specific documents dealing with the book of Abraham. Robin Scott Jensen, after having done that, 
is now sitting down on the LDS Perspectives podcast and saying, listen, the evidence is there. Joseph is working, or at least appears to be. The evidence supports that Joseph Smith is working with the papyri that we as a church have in our possession. That displaces the missing scroll theory done. Door closed. That one's gone. Now, he wants to argue in front of the in, for, in, uh, in favor of the catalyst theory. So then he moves into a place where he says, look, I've shared this analogy of parents. And what he's talking about, you'd have to go back and listen to the podcast. I'll have the link in the notes. Uh, in this interview, he says, look, sometimes parents make assumptions. Uh, and he uses one example where he says, look, these parents have some bad information on uh, how to treat an illness of their child. And so the parents then go to Heavenly Father and they pray and Heavenly Father gives them an answer in connection with this bad information that they had. And they apply this revelation from Heavenly Father and the child is miraculously healed. And so his, his conclusion is just because we have bad assumptions doesn't mean that the revelation we receive is uh, bad on its own. And then he relates this back to the book of Abraham by saying that just because Joseph Smith thought he was working with the papyri doesn't stop God from giving him an an answer based on the understanding that he had, but still more uh, additional truth being unveiled to the world. In other words, that Joseph thinks he's working with the papyri, that's a bad assumption. God gives him the book of Abraham, that's a good assumption. Um, So let's stop there for a moment. Here's the problem. Again, go back to Abraham chapter one, verse 12 through 14. And what you find is that Abraham himself in our sacred text of the book of Abraham is telling the world that, hey, it's those facsimiles and those characters that immediately follow that those facsimiles that is this text right here that I'm writing down. You cannot, there's no leeway. There's no room to say that Joseph is looking at the papyri and he thinks it's the book of Abraham, but God is giving him something entirely different. Abraham himself puts his foot down and says, no way, Jose. Then lastly, Robin Scott Jensen says um, that there's a human part of this process that God intends to give Joseph Smith the book of Abraham, but that at any point Joseph has his agency and he can stop listening to God and insert his own thing. RFM, if you are the conduit of God and God is revealing to you by the gift and power of God, the book of Abraham, At what point would you be like, oh yeah, Heavenly Father, hold on a minute. I'm going to insert my own ideas here and I'm going to tell some stories that come out of the book of Jasher and the book of Josephus and I'm just going to like start inserting my own thing and, but you know what, I've got agency and, uh, and God, if you can just hold on a moment, we'll get back to what you have to say in a second. What's the reality of that happening? I think the reality of the position for which the speaker is arguing is becoming more and more and more remote. But he's being forced there more and more and more because of the evidence. So now he's got to try and come up with a theory that accounts for the book of Abraham as scripture, in some sense, in spite of all of the evidence. Now, he's taken into account the evidence from the Kirtland Egyptian papers as well as the book of Abraham, and I think the verses that you quoted, that obviously Joseph Smith thinks and is claiming and is presenting as translating the Egyptian hieroglyphs into the book of Abraham. But now Robin Scott Jensen is arguing that even though Joseph Smith believes it, he's wrong. So we get to the place where, once again, Joseph Smith was wrong about what he was doing, even what he believed he was doing, Bill. Not just what he claimed he was doing, it has to be what he believed he was doing for this argument to work. uh, All the church presidents have been wrong about what Joseph Smith was doing. The book of Abraham itself is wrong about what Joseph Smith was doing. But finally, Robin Scott Jensen, he's finally figured it out. So good for him. He's got it all over Joseph Smith. 
So you got to understand he's trumping Joseph Smith. Now, let me just say one other thing here, Bill. This problem goes directly to the Book of Mormon. And this is one of the reasons that the issues related to the Book of Abraham have a direct connection to the Book of Mormon. Now, the Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith claimed to translate from Egyptian on papyrus. The Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith claimed to translate from Reformed Egyptian on gold plates. And just as Joseph Smith presents as translating exact hieroglyphs from the recovered papyri into the book of Abraham, in the same way, Joseph Smith presented as translating specific characters on the gold plates into specific words. That is woven in to the fiber of church history related to the translation of the Book of Mormon. You will recall that when he sent Martin Harris to New York, who ends up encountering Charles Antone, to corroborate the glyphs or the characters that Joseph Smith has copied off the gold plates, it's not just the characters that Joseph Smith sends. Remember what Martin Harris says and go read it yourself if you don't recall this. Martin Harris says that Charles Antone said that the characters were correct and the translation that Joseph Smith had provided of the characters was also correct. So that is Joseph Smith translating directly from the characters on the gold plates, at least the way that it's presented as doing. Also, in the translation process, Multiple witnesses describe Joseph Smith as seeing a character or more than one character on his stone in the hat or in the, the glow of the light above the stone. He sees a character and above it he sees the English translation. And he reads that off to his scribe. And once he gets done with a sentence, the procedure is that Joseph Smith has the scribe read it back to him so that he can confirm that what Joseph Smith is seeing in the hat corresponds to the sentence that the scribe took down. That's the double check on the translation in the process. If Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon by translating Reformed Egyptian from the gold plates, character by character, into what we have as the text of the Book of Mormon, and we find out that now we've got the Egyptian papyri for the Book of Abraham. Of course, we're never going to get the plates for the Book of Mormon because Moroni has those, right? Right. So they're safely off stage. They're never coming back. I don't care about the Chicago fire for the gold plates. But now we've got the papyri for the Book of Abraham where we can see Joseph Smith is doing exactly the same thing he claimed to do with the Book of Mormon, translating specific Egyptian characters into scriptural text. Only now, with the book of Abraham, we know that the translation he gave has nothing to do with the characters he was presenting as translating. So you can see why the issue with the book of Abraham translation goes directly to the foundation of the book of Mormon as well. If Joseph Smith was completely incorrectly translating Egyptian from papyri into the book of Abraham, what are we to say about his translation of Reformed Egyptian characters on gold plates into the Book of Mormon? Yeah, and as you notice, right at this moment, the church is also having to deal with these two sacred texts side by side in the same way. And over the last six months, you heard it here first. We told you there was a plan, a 10 to 20 year plan to walk back the idea of translation and to change that word throughout the correlated material and in our understanding, in our milieu, as we listen to um, firesides and conference talks and speeches at the universities, that the word translation is so slowly going to shift over to revelation. And, I'm, and you're already having seen that happen. So the Book of Mormon has the same problem. It has too many issues. And again, we don't have the plates, as you point out, RFM, but we certainly can see all the 19th century material that Richard Bushman points to. Long phraseology, sermons, theology, 
all of that. And so the church is having to deal with the fact that Joseph is inserting so much of his own mind and culture and the material available to him in his day in all four of the church's accepted translation productions that Joseph worked on and then also plays out in part with a scam known as the Kinderhook Plates. Now, let me say this. To make all this work, here's what you have to do. You have to distance Joseph Smith from the writings of Abraham. You have to distance Joseph Smith from the writings being written by Abraham's own hand. You have to distance Joseph Smith from the grammar and alphabet document. You have to distance the papyri from the actual translation. You have to distance the facsimiles from where they're located in the text. You have to distance the facsimiles from their interpretation. And you have to, as Robin Scott Jensen pointed to, the only way to explain Abraham 1.12 through 1.14 is to say that while God is giving Joseph this, this sacred scripture, unconnected to the papyri in order to support the catalyst theory, you have to have Joseph Smith using his agency and imposing that Abraham himself is pointing to the facsimiles and the words, the the characters on the papyri when Abraham did not do that. Now, what I just listed, let me ask you, is it more rational and logical and reasonable and plausible to just throw all of this out as made up and excuse my language, but bullshit? Or are you, are, is it more reasonable, logical, plausible, acceptable to say like, no, let's make all of these allowances, all these loopholes to deal with all these problems that are right in our face. And at the end of the day, it's not even close. Like if you allow yourself to even be 10% rational, there's no way to put the toothpaste back in the tube. No, it's hard to argue with your position on that, Bill, at least for me. I will note, however, that an interesting thing happens with an application of the catalyst theory, because if the book of Abraham has nothing to do with what was on the papyrus that Joseph Smith believed he was translating, then we can presume that the book of Mormon has nothing to do with the characters on the gold plates that Joseph Smith claimed to be translating. And if we take it one step further to the Kinderhook plates, it doesn't make any difference that the Kinderhook plates were a fraud. Under the catalyst theory, Joseph Smith could still have believed he was translating the fraudulent carvings and characters on the Kinderhook plates and come up with authentic scripture. So yes, but as you pointed out, This is the place we all go to when we need these things to be true. What we do is we say, okay, the data imposes that this looks like a fraud. So now we have to walk our solution back to a place where it also looks exactly the same way the fraud looks. In other words, as an outsider looking at this from the outside, it is impossible, as you pointed out, to discern whether it's a fraud or whether it's God giving Joseph a uh, inspired text that allows him to, one, have it be completely disconnected from the things he says about how he translated, completely disconnected from the documents themselves that he's translating from, and allows him to use his agency to impose words into others' mouths that force us again to go back to holding the translation as something other than God inspiring him unconnected to the text. Right. As you say, not only does the catalyst theory force the theorist to claim that Joseph Smith had no clue as to what he was talking about when he thought he was translating these characters into the book of Abraham, it is also objectively indistinguishable from an intentional fraud on the part of Joseph Smith. Yeah, and at that point, if you're honest, again, every listener out there who is believing and making this work, you can hang on if you want to. My suggestion would be to hit stop and not listen to stuff like this. Because if you ask yourself in your head, 
what is the most reasonable response to all of this? And it's the fact that Joseph made it up. And so, yes, if you want to believe, you can say, no, no, no. All the rules get broken. Everything gets dismissed. Not going to deal with the data. And God just gave Joseph uh, a inspired text in his brain and allowed Joseph to corrupt that inspired dictation from God to Joseph to allow for things such as Abraham 1, 12 through 14. That's irrational. That's irrational. And so after this episode is over, after these two parts are over, every listener has got to have to come to grips that none of this adds up. And I, and I, on some level, RFM, I'm impressed with what we've done with, with all of this material to show this, because I think it is as clear as crystal. Now, that said, we want to finish up with two last issues. One is also arguing against all of this, and then we'll end by giving you a little tiny ray of hope. So the one against it, RFM, would you explain to us the geography of this area and why there's a problem here? Well, I think that it would help if the audience were able to open their Bibles. And in the back, you've got uh, some maps there of the old world. And if you can pause if you need to, but really seeing a map does give a thousand words to what I'm going to try and describe, because it will make a lot more sense if you look at it on a map back in the, uh, the end of the Bible. It's also in the LDS version of the Bible. If you happen to have one of those lying around, most Bibles have them. It has to do with the relationship of the Egyptian empire to the location where the book of Abraham has Abraham being sacrificed, or at least attempted to be sacrificed. And that is in the city or the land of Ur, U-R. Ur, if you look on your Bible map, is not in Egypt. It is in Babylon. It is in the Babylonian empire. And the Babylonian empire is a long way away from Egypt. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. It's over the Fertile Crescent. So you can't just go east from Egypt to get to Babylon because then you're going through no man's land. You have to go up and over the Fertile Crescent to get to Babylon. And Ur is not even in northern Babylon. It's not in central Babylon. It's in southern Babylon. It's on the Euphrates River, and it's really not that far from the Persian Gulf. So you've got a location problem here, which is you've got Egypt here, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Ur in the Chaldees, which is where the book of Abraham takes place. Now, Egypt being an empire would sometimes expand and contract, but rarely did it expand very far into uh, Palestine and beyond Palestine. Usually its expansion was south and west into uh, different parts of Africa. But there was one time in about 1500 BCE when the Egyptian empire was at its biggest. And even at its biggest, it has a neck of land that comes up through Palestine and then up in a northwest direction, sort of like a finger of land. And it is still hundreds and hundreds of miles. It doesn't even get to Babylon. It doesn't even get to the Babylonian Empire, much less way down south in the Babylonian Empire to Ur. Okay, so now why do I go to all this trouble to explain this? Because the book of Abraham puts the sacrifice of Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees, and Chaldees means Babylon, in Ur, in Babylon, in this city, in southern Babylon. And it doesn't just put a sacrifice there, but the book of Abraham requires a strong Egyptian influence in this city, where Egypt never had any influence whatsoever. Once again, the closest the, the Egyptian empire got to Ur of the Chaldees was hundreds and hundreds of miles to the north. There is no reason, historically, why a priest of Pharaoh should appear in Ur of the Chaldees to sacrifice Isaac, or excuse me, to sacrifice Abraham for any reason whatsoever. And if you read through Abraham 1 with that in mind, you will see that throughout the chapter, 
the presence and the influence of Egyptian characters and culture is made manifest. For example, verse 8, Now at this time it was the custom of the priest of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to offer up upon the altar, which was built in the land of Chaldea, that's Babylon, this is a huge glaring error if you know the geography and the history, for the offering unto these strange gods, men, women, and children. Okay, you go over to verse 20. Behold, Potiphar's hill was in the land of Ur of Chaldea. You can't get away from the fact that this is taking place in Ur. Okay, the book of Abraham says it. That's where chapter 1 takes place. But there was no Egyptian influence ever in Ur of the Chaldees. Behold, Potiphar's hill was in the land of Ur of Chaldea. And the Lord broke down the altar of Elkanah and of the gods of the land and utterly destroyed them and smote the priests that he died. And there was great mourning in Chaldea and also in the court of Pharaoh. Now that's, why is there mourning in the court of Pharaoh? Hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of miles away over the Fertile Crescent, over his priest being killed, who never would have been there in Ur in the first place. But apparently news travels fast and bad news travels faster. So it gets back to the Pharaoh and which Pharaoh signifies kings by royal blood. Anyway, so you can see that throughout Chapter 1, the problem is Egypt never had any influence, even at its grandest moment in its empire in 1500 BC, never was anywhere near having any influence or presence in Ur of the Chaldee, Chaldees. And yet, Abraham chapter 1, to quote you, Bill, deeply imposes the fact that Egyptian influence would have to be there. Yeah, they're too far apart. So we've added another another book on the shelf, another 10-pound weight on the shelf, and this shelf is shattered to pieces over the course of the last, say, three and a half hours or so. So let's finish up. So let's, for, for the listener who goes like, oh, I just, I need it to stay together. I've got to, got to figure out a way that I still believe in this thing. Y- you've got two options. And we're going to add a piece of evidence for the first option. The first option is just ignore what we said. Just ignore the last three and a half, four hours of material and just decide like, I'm going to believe anyway. You can do that. Lots of people are doing it. It sounds like Molstein's doing it. So it's great. Do that. Um, But the other option you can, and we'll give you a piece of evidence for that. The other thing you can do is that you can recognize like, oh, everything is myth. All scriptures are myth. The Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, the Quran, uh, the Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, all of it. And you can still find truth and meaning in that. And and I, on, in some level, like even as an outsider of the church now, um, I do it that way. I still find great value in Jesus, though I, I don't believe him to have risen on the third day. I find great value still, believe it or not, in the Book of Mormon, uh, in the New Testament, uh, and I find value in other uh, books of scripture like the uh, Bhagavad Gita, for instance. And um, you can do that. You're going to find that Mormonism doesn't make it easy on you to do that, but that's certainly a view you can hold. Now, that said, I want to end with, because I thought this was impressive, uh, RFM, and truly amazed by this. Um, I wonder if you can walk us through this, this ray of sunshine poking through all this gloominess that you and I have just given, uh, and you can maybe help the person who wants to hold on have something to hang their hat on. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Bill. About 25 years ago, I was uh, poking around the local small town library with Time to Kill, and I pulled a book off the shelf. It was a book about Egyptology. It was about 100 years old. It was written by an Egyptologist with the last name of Budge, And what it was, was a dictionary of sorts that had Egyptian characters in the margin, and then it had the translation next to them. It was sort of like an Egyptian alphabet and grammar. Actually, that's what it was, an Egyptian alphabet and grammar, except this was done in a scholarly way, as opposed to the way that Joseph Smith did it. This actually represents the Egyptological view and translation of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. So I'm looking at this and there's, I mean, there's pages and pages and pages and pages of this. And fortunately it was on the first page of the alphabet and grammar section and four characters down, 
I see this little stick figure that he draws, which look kind of familiar to me. And let me tell you what I mean, okay? If you go to facsimile number one and open it up and you look at the person Abraham on the couch, okay? And he's got his right leg up in the air and he's got his two hands up in front of his face and you can see him both there. But he is specifically identified as Abraham on the lion couch there. This facsimile illustrates the crisis moment in chapter one of the book of Abraham. When Abraham is about to be slain, he is praying to the Lord for deliverance and the Lord sends his angel down and delivers him. It is represented in verse 15 of chapter one, where Abraham says in the first person, and as they lifted up their hands upon me, that they might offer me up and take away my life. Behold, I lifted up my voice unto the Lord my God. By the way, there's a very nice, and David Bakavoy might say even beautiful, parallelism going on here with the language. And as they lifted up their hands upon me, I lifted up my voice to God. So what happens is God responds to it, sends down the angel of his presence, boom, Abraham is delivered. This is what is being represented here in facsimile number one. It's when Abraham is lifting up his voice and praying to God for deliverance. Excuse me. So if you take this, look at Abraham, take your book, turn it 90 degrees counterclockwise so that Abraham, don't look at anything else in the, in the book or in the facsimile, just look at Abraham. So he's turned counterclockwise. Now he's up on his feet. You can see that. And now he would be standing with one leg in front of the other in true Egyptian hieroglyphic style, and he's got his hands up in front of his face. That is the hieroglyph, a man standing one foot in front of the other with his hands in front of his face, just the way Abraham is depicted here in facsimile one, once you turn it counterclockwise, 90 degrees. That is the exact same hieroglyph that I saw in Budge's Alphabet and Grammar that represents the Egyptian word which translated into English means prayer or worship. So what I'm saying is that Joseph Smith managed to translate the fact that Abraham here is in a position that denotes prayer in Egyptian, actually supported by real Egyptologists who are not Mormon, Bill. He actually translate that in the text and the story of Abraham 1 as Abraham praying to the Lord for deliverance. And I think it's even bigger than that. So the original image is believed that there's... So if you go find the facsimile one in the actual image of the document that the church has in its possession, you'll notice that the document is deeply deteriorated. Large chunks of the document are missing. One of the things that are missing is a large portion of one of Abraham's hands. Again, we're assuming it's Abraham. Um, that portion that's missing, Egyptologists claim that that should be a second bird, that the hand is actually the wing of the bird, but that Joseph Smith in error adds a hand where a bird's wing should be. When you understand that with what you just said, this becomes the greatest bullseye uh, in one defending the book of Abraham as a sacred document. It does connect in a way. It allows you a little bit of space to say like, there's two things going on. Joseph is interacting with the document, but he's also receiving revelation that's unconnected from the document. So again, if one wants something to hang their hat on, uh, this I think is the strongest bullseye that exists on the book of Abraham and I've never heard Kerry Molstein uh, speak about this one at all, or John Gee. And so those are your two church apologists who are Egyptologists, and they seem unaware of the greatest evidence in favor of the book of Abraham that's out there. Well, thank you, Bill. That's very kind of you. Uh, honestly, I would have thought that somebody would have seen this since then, and, I, and I've learned from other research that maybe somebody has seen this, so I can't be claiming to say be saying it for the very first time tonight. But what struck me about it and what made me remember it from 25 years ago, because I'd really forgotten about it, Bill, was when I was watching Carrie Mulestein talking in this fair Mormon video, talking about this very picture 
of Abraham on the couch in this very strange posture with his leg up and his hands above his face. And Carrie Muelstein, remember he's the Egyptologist, Bill. He doesn't recognize that this is Abraham praying in a perfectly legitimate hieroglyph that shows he's praying. No, instead he's talking about this shows that Abraham is struggling and he's trying to uh, protect himself against the knife from the priest because he doesn't want to get sacrificed. And I'm I, that's what made me think of it. All of a sudden I thought, wait a second, no. Carrie Muelstein, you're the Egyptologist. You can't see that if you turn this 90 degrees, Abraham is praying just like the book of Abraham says. You're thinking, you're sort of making stuff up that he's struggling when that has nothing to do with Egyptology and a lot more to do with Carrie Muelstein's imagination. So that's what made me think of it. And I just wanted to point it out to Kerry Muelstein because I think that Abraham praying is a lot stronger argument for his position than Abraham struggling. Yeah, and I will add to it, uh, this seems much stronger than the crocodile god. This seems much stronger than the four canopic jars. And, it, and, it's, and it's much stronger than the evidence that these guys present that's found in the book of Jasher or Josephus. Uh, that Joseph it had acknowledged by the church access to. So again, for those who Mormonism, it works for you and you want to believe, amen, hang your hat on this thing. Um, but recognize that overall, collectively, this whole thing to, to hold up the book of Abraham as being anything near what the church has claimed it to be or needs it to be, um, to be highly irrational, improbable, unreasonable, implausible. Um, so I think as far as I'm concerned, I think we've tackled this issue as well or as in depth covering as much ground as I've ever seen. I don't know how anybody could walk away from this podcast feeling like there were areas of this conversation that we didn't hit on. Cause I think we hit everything and maybe added some new things to the conversation. Um, I feel, I feel content knowing that we have, chewed up and spit out the book of Abraham uh, in a couple of nights here, my friend. So I'm happy to give it to you if you've got any kind of closing thoughts. Yes. And as uh, I agree with you, first off, Carrie Muelstein, if you want to use the argument about Abraham praying that I brought up to you, please do so. I just ask that you credit me, Radio Free Mormon, anytime you talk about it. That's funny, by the way. Can you imagine Carrie Molstein and John Gee going like, oh, there's this new evidence. And we learned about this from a critic of the church. And I mean critic in terms of giving, giving constructive criticism. Um, a critic of the church, Radio Free Mormon, that's going to uh, make me uh, warm the cockles of my heart if I hear that. Well, I've always wanted you to have warm cockles, Bill. Okay, I want to say that Dan Vogel is the man. It's Dan the Man Vogel. He has on YouTube a series of um, uh, incredibly well-documented and researched videos about the Book of Abraham. It goes into more depth in the Kirtland Egyptian papers. If you want to learn more about this, please go to those videos. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Uh, so I want to recommend Dan Vogel's videos. By the way, it's Dan Vogel, V-O-G-E-L, German for bird, as in the bird that's flying down as figure one in facsimile one of the book of Abraham. Finally, I want to say that even though we've gone on for quite a while now in these two parts, Bill, there is still so much more we could talk about that would actually be on point. But that's the way it is with the book of Abraham. Actually, the reason we came up with this idea for this podcast is something that we haven't even touched upon at all, which is the article that Carrie Muelstein wrote for the December edition of the Enzyme magazine. It's currently on your newsstands. Run out and catch a copy before they're all gone. But it is about the book of Abraham, and we haven't even touched on that, Bill. So let's pull back in this podcast, and if the public acclaim is great enough and the public demand is large enough. Maybe we'll come back sometime with a part three. Anyway, it's been a joy, a pleasure. It's been an enlightening and edifying experience talking with you, Bill Real, about the book of Abraham.